So as you move to the east, you're in a different formation, and it erodes, it wears down a lot faster, so it doesn't make the usual, you know, big, very steep um, mountains with the very, very narrow valleys that characterize the coast range. And Little Lake doesn't have that. You've got this, you know, honking big valley. And there's other places that there's big valleys. When you drive down the Umpqua, or you drive down the Sayus Law, even when you drive down Lake Creek. But those are big rivers. Those aren't the size of Lake Creek. And those big rivers cut down and carved terraces as they went. Those are the valleys along the on the Soyuz Law. So this is different. And so before I walk you into why it's different, the best way for me to see this is to rotate you know, the traditional view of things looking north. So here's the picture we were just looking at. There's Little Lake and Triangle Lake. And now what I've done is just rotate it around. So north is now going this way. OK? And what I want you to focus on, I'm going to take you to the next slide. There's Triangle Little Lake again. I want you to focus in on this area. Okay? So this is the exact same slide, but now I've ex vertically exaggerated it one and a half times. And what you have here is a giant landslide. Mm -hmm. This is a landslide from about 50,000 years ago. We're still working out the date. Um, it's a minimum of 42,000 years old, but it's probably about 50,000. And this entire mountainside came down. Um, most likely, I mean, no one knows, but you know, for that amount of a mountain to come down, it's likely one of the megaquakes. So as the plate is going underneath the coast of Oregon, um, it gets stuck and then occasionally releases, and they're starting to find in a lot of lake deposits, um, turbinate deposits, every 500 years. So it run about a, every 500 year cycle for these giant quakes, and there's actually a line, Loon Lake is probably another remnant uh, from a mega quake. So this giant landslide came down, and here's Lake Creek, I did my little thing in um, PowerPoint, so you could follow it there, but it blocked it, it dammed the entire thing. And so the entire valley is like a re was like a reservoir behind the dam. So 50,000 years ago, the valley bottom was about 200 feet below where we're standing now. So just like a reservoir, you had all of the sediment coming in from these hill slopes. The dam wasn't broached yet, so this creek could not flow out. So all the sediment would come in, and it would just, and the water would just pile up behind this dam. And then eventually, at some point, this land, giant landslide dam breached, and Lake Creek for, you know, continue to do its work. But what's great from a paleo um, perspective is it's pinned over here. So it wasn't going back and forth across the valley. It's been pinned over here. And, um, and now you kind of reach your, the whole lake is lowered. You're down to the former valley, the bottom of the lake, essentially. And it's done in GIS to help you visualize this. So once again, here's the landslide deposit. Not as pretty as in the Lord. Um, but this is, you know, the Triangle Lake store is right here. There's the road that goes up and over into the Little Lake watershed. When you go over that road, look at it as you come down into Little Lake and look on the road cuts and you'll see there's honking big boulders in there. And then the minute it flattens out when you get to Little Lake, you'll see that the road cut has really fine material all over again. So that little um, bump of land that's behind the store, that's part of the old landslide deposit. So this is just taking a GIS layer and basically saying, um, where's, where does the contour interval not really change more than 10 meters, 30 feet? I tend to speak in metric, and if you're not metric familiar and I don't um, give you the English equivalent, just tolerate me and I'll do some quick math and I'll probably be wrong, but it'll be close enough. So anyway, this is just a, basically, the valley floor is really flat. And go home tonight and look at this in Google um, Maps, because it looks exactly like this. That just took away that little layer I made. So this, all of this wonderful farmland through here, is the old lake bottom. The water's retreated, and there's the lake bottom. And below it is, of course, the original valley floor. So we've got you know, 50,000 years of sediment that's been pouring down and building up layer by layer by layer. So, 
That's how little I came to be, not a caldera. I don't want anyone here to ever tell me it's a caldera. <laughs> um, but it's really, it's actually a cool, it's really cool now to go into Google Earth and spin around and see what you can see. So, I'm working on understanding climate-driven landscape change. And, you know, it's pretty intuitive. Climate changes, you know, going from glacial times to non-glacial times, you expect that the landscape response is going to be different. But surprisingly, we really haven't nailed yet how, how it works, mechanistically, what happens. You can go to a glacial landscape, and you can stand in that landscape and see the glaciers just grinding the mountain apart, and how that changes. You know, when the glaciers are gone, you have this big beveled surface, and you have your surf lakes. You can see that. But in soil mantle landscapes, um, we actually haven't yet been able to tease apart the mechanics of how it happens. Does it, when it rains more, do the raindrops hit the dirt and then that make, leads to overland flow and that's why you might break down the mountain faster? Is it because um, the vegetation changes and the way the vegetation works on the land um, might have an impact? So this study is all about getting to the mechanics of how it works. Currently, most um, studies that look at climate change through time and how um, landscape response are based on major events, terrace deposits. So you go out to you know, the Sayusla or the Ilmquan, there's a whole series of terraces going all the way up the mountains, and they have big floodplain sediments on them. But those events are giant episodic events, and it's just like working in streams. Um, uh, most of you, I'm sure, are pretty familiar with the term bait pool. Term what? So, the idea that the flood events, even though they're the dramatic ones and the ones you remember and you tell your grandchildren about, they only happen once every 100, once every 200 years. It's the day-to-day -day events. It's when the river is running and it is just high enough to be able to pick up sediment and you know, bounce that sediment along the riverbed and scour this, the bed and slowly, slowly, slowly incise it or slowly, slowly, slowly cut into the hills. That's where the majority of the work happens, because that's what happens every single, happens most of the time, where those giant flood events only happen occasionally. So for climate change, most of our records for how the landscape might respond are based on these really giant events. And what we haven't had is a way to really get at how does landscape respond on the 100 or 200 or 1,000 year time scale. Um, until um, we a uh, really cool new tool came along I'm going to tell you about that we're using in this study. So we don't really have a mechanistic way of understanding how climate change and the associated ecological changes might influence the way mountains evolve over time. And it's hard for other reasons. Um, when climate changes, it takes a while for the land to respond to that. So you, know, you might have, things might erode faster or they might erode slower, but that might, for you to actually see that response, might be thousands and thousands of years out. And whoops, climate then goes and changes again. And suddenly you can't really see what happened in the record. There's also not many sites that, where this is preserved. Landscapes are dynamic. Things change over time. So finding a place where this history is preserved really hard, and there was, has not until recently been a tool where we can really measure erosion rates at this scale of mountain evolution at the 10 to 100,000 year scale. So there's Triangle Lake, and I'm going to tell you all the reasons it's such a fabulous place to do this work. Um, so I've zoomed in a little bit, and here's the top of the ridge boundary. Not going out to the reefs, I'm only going right down here to the lake. Okay, And not surprisingly, so I'm just putting up one of the famous people who has said this, but not surprisingly, small, quiescent lakes are really ideal for recording periodic climate change, right? You don't have big floods coming through. You don't have things wiping out the record or imprinting on top of the record. The sediment is just slowly coming down, you know, maybe coming out of debris flows occasionally, but it's get creeping down the mountain, and it's all gathering in one place, let year after year after year after year. And one reason for doing a uh, little lake and not triangle lake is because this is such a small watershed, which means that all of the information for how the landscape is changing over time 
integrates and will be recorded in this small area. So the minute you go out to something like Triangle Lake, where you have one watershed that dumps something over here, and another watershed that dumps something over here, it gets much harder to really look at an integrated record. So that's why um, Little Lake is so fabulous. Okay, so before I get into the study, this is the little geomorphic primer. Okay, just so we're all on the same page. I told you I come from TMDL land, um, and erosion, you know, is a, a word that's tossed around a lot. And um, many times when I think about erosion, uh, or until I started really um, going into this style of geomorphology, I think about you know, sediment that's coming off the fields, you know, or the big storm event happens in the city, you know, you get the you know, impervious surfaces and water just picks up everything in its path, and that's called erosion. Well, that's actually sediment that's already been eroded from the bedrock that's sitting in storage and the water is picking up and moving. In this case, I'm talking about the wearing away of rock, so actually breaking rock apart. And one thing you have to understand about geomorphologists is we don't think of the rock wearing down this way, especially in the coast where there's uplift. So you've got the plate coming underneath and the whole coast range is being pushed up at a steady rate. And so we think of the rock as coming up to the surface. So it comes up to the surface and agents of change, be it water or wind or plants, they get, it gets into, a, into the very top part where things can start to attack it. Water can begin to um, leach out chemicals and make the rock mechanically weak. Trees can get in there and they get into the bedrock and then they fall over and they bring all that bedrock up with it. Now you have material that can be transported down slope. So when I talk about erosion, I'm talking about literally wearing away the mountain, okay? And not just moving sediment off from the top of it. So I'm also, I keep talking about plants and plants eroding the landscape. And in general, plants are thought of as stabilizers, right? If you want to keep the dirt on your property, you plant. If you want to stop the creek bank from wearing away, you put in willows. And you know, here, you know, the old WPA crews and a modern crew bringing out plants, building a brush mattress. Um, erosion is, is or, plants are stabilizers over the short term. But over long time scales, they are fabulous mobilizers. This is a Doug fir. This is one of my cohorts of scale. Um, this is part of the bedrock in the roots of that old tree. I mean, this tree was going down, you know, I don't know, he's at least a meter tall, so a meter and a half, digging into soil and bedrock. And when those things fall over, it brings up an awful lot of material. So biota can dilate the soil, gophers do it, ants do it. Um, larger biota, things like gophers and trees, um, will convert bedrock to soil via burrows and tree throws, root expansion, and then mounds and tree throws transport the soil downstream. So you can picture that this whole bedrock to soil conversion, which is the way mountains break down in soil mantle landscapes, that the mixing and transport, so the way we erode the land, the rate that it's eroded, should vary with different ecosystems. So if you have a grassland, you know, grass, if you have enough of it, is a good stabilizer. But it's really terrible getting into the bedrock and ripping it apart. I don't know, those puny roots, they can't do anything. They don't have anything out of dead fir tree which can get in there and really not only just keep tossing stuff up to be transported out, but provides a pathway for water to get deeper down and to really um, erode that thin layer of rock that's coming up to the surface. Okay, so this is the cool tool. And some of you might have heard about this, but I'll just go through the talk just in case, okay? It's shorthand is CRN. It stands for Cosmogenic Nuclei, Nucleides, Radionucleides, excuse me. And this is the way it works. Cosmic rays rain down all the time. They rain on me, they rain on you, they rain on this building, okay? They rain all across the earth at a constant rate. And they occasionally cl collide with certain nuclei. In this case, in this watershed, and in most of the places where this technique is used, it's quartz that people care about. Because when those cosmic rays collide with quartz at a constant rate, they produce rare isotopes or nucleides. And this is just like carbon-14, but it's a lot longer-lived. 
So in my case, I work with beryllium 10 and aluminum 26, and they have half-lives of um, a million and a half to two million years. So you can record stuff over a really long time. The half-life of carbon-14, which people use for dating um, organic materials, 57,000 years. It's after that, it's really not, if something's older than that, you have to go to other techniques. So you can picture that the rock is coming up to the surface, and stuff is raining down at a constant rate, and it's hitting these, hitting these quartz grains, and if stuff comes up very, 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 very slowly, it'll accumulate a lot of these, right? Where instead, if it's coming up very, very fast because you've got trees or gophers or whatever it is, on top, it's removing stuff as fast as you can bring the rock up, you're going to have a very low concentration. So you can use these cosmic, these um, cosmogenic radionuclei to measure erosion rates, which is a really fabulous tool. Um, so, putting it together. Now I'm finally at the study. <laughs> okay. Um, everyone on the same page with me so far? Yeah. Okay, so, Little League Watershed. It's got this great paleo archive. Um, and I know when I talked to Dan, um, and they had been drilling out there in the Newmans, their wells, I looked at the well logs. 200 feet of sediment before bottom was hit. That's a lot of history, right? At a lake bottom, because lakes, you know, the water, the sediment is very, very thin when it comes down. And it's quartz rich. The Taiyi formation, which is what is out here, is quartz rich. And that means we can quantify erosion rates over the time scale of climate fluctuation. So, as many of you know, in the 90s, there were researchers out here who also poured out at Little Lake. Um, and they were looking for the vegetation record. So they cored on um, the opposite side of the lake. I'll show you in a minute where I cored. And their whole purpose was to look at pollen records and macrofossil and, and see how infer climate from the ecosystems they, they could see in the core record. Okay? So this is a pollen accumulation ratio chart. I'm not going to go into what it is. I'm just going to show you the take home messages that are in here. So I divided it up. They, their core, the oldest date they found at the bottom, they were actually on top of the landslide, was 42,000 years. And from 42,000 years to 26,000 years ago, here's the dominant species. You had fern hemlock and you had white pine. Those were the dominant species. They um, describe it as an open canopy forest. Okay, so widely spaced, you can see through it. Then, the glacial starts. Okay, I don't know if you remember your climate change charts, you kind of go slowly into getting colder and colder and colder, right? So this is going slowly and colder and colder and colder. It reaches a point where we're in where it's really cold. And then the fern hemlock go away. There's Engelman and Sitka spruce, lodgepole pine, okay? And then if you remember, if you ever go and look at those climate change charts, the, you know, the ones that have all the, the oxygen records and everything else, when you go from the glacial to the interglacial, when it gets warm again, it is like a rocket. So there's sawtooth designs. It goes cold, 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 and then suddenly really warm. So that's what happened 13,000 years ago. That's the Holocene. That's the period we're in now. And Engelman spruce and Sitka spruce gone within 100 years. Not, no pollen record of them in the lake. The lodgepole pine, gone. But what came in was the Doug fir. Whoops, maybe I won't do this to the screen anymore. So there's the Doug fir. They come in within 100 years, totally different ecosystem. And so this is what's inferred from the vegetation. And this needs a lot of refinement still, but this is basic. The basic stuff is that when it was in the non-glacial, um, it was cooler, about three degrees cooler and wetter. And then during the glacial, it was never glaciated here. And this is a really important point. Okay, the coast range is um, the center of geomorphology world because it's where um, many geomorphology laws have been developed because the idea is that this landscape was never glaciated and the landscape has had time to equilibrate. And so you can come up with uh, physical laws that describe the processes and describe the form, okay? Um, I'm actually going to argue that that's not true, but we'll get to that in a second. So it was about 7 degrees C cooler, and in the January months, the cold month of the year, up to 14 degrees colder. And then um, here we are now with the nice and warm and wet. So what does that mean? Well, 
Number one, I'm always terrible at Celsius, so I have uh, put the Celsius numbers on this side, and then I translate them to Fahrenheit by Fahrenheit on the say, right axis. So this is data from the Canary Weather Station, which is south of here. It's 20 kilometers above sea level, so much closer uh, to sea level than we are here. There's 50 years of data, and you can see what the uh, temperature looks going from January 1st to December 31st. If it was 7 degrees colder, okay, you'd be here. So, you know, in your hot months, you'd be in the 50 degrees, and in your cold months, you'd be around 32 degrees. If it was 14 degrees colder, you'd be way down here in that corner in January. Now that corner, okay, this is, is from negative three to negative eight degrees is what's called the frost cracking window. And that's the optimum temperature to have ice lens form in the rock. And rather than, like we have today, trees being the dominant way to break apart rock, it's ice that will do it instead, okay? So you can see you're starting to do a little bit of excursion into that window. But don't forget, Little Lake is 200 to 600 meters higher than this weather station. So it's very, very likely that a significant amount of time in the glacial, we were down in this whole other world where things look very different. So the big hypothesis for this project is that profound changes in weathering processes correlate with variations in erosion rate. So I can go to the record in the core and look at what the weathering processes are. I can go to analog landscapes and look at what the weathering processes are, and I can measure erosion rates. The, um, originally, we started out, we being myself and my collaborators, not the royal we, but in the non-glacial time, this is the best picture I could find of an uh, open pine forest. But you can see how different that is than our beloved Doug Fur. Um, that, you have less erosion because you've reduced below ground biomass and the shallower mixing depths and you can't turn um, the bedrock into soil as fast as you can in the dug fur, which are very, very efficient bedrock converters to soil. They are very efficient agents of erosion. Um, and so here, tree throw processes dominate and there's this tremendous vigor, um, even in an old growth dug fur forest, over 80% of the biomass is dug fur, despite all the other tree types coming in. And then in the glacial period, we weren't quite sure until I started looking at these temperature things, if it's a, described as an open parkland setting, so a few trees, kind of if you were go hiking in Idaho, in the mountains, so grasslands with a few scattered trees, if the vegetation there would serve as a, this would serve as a, um, just a shallow stabilizer or if everything would go because the grass will even hold things in place. But now that we've started thinking about these frost river processes, it's a whole different story. And it's unlikely that the Coast Range it was, is this beautiful 50,000 years of behaving the same. The geomorphologists have been using it as, as a test ground for it. Um, this is an example of frost driven bedrock in the Southern Alps. So this is talus here, oh, this is talus, I'm sorry, this is talus acre, and everything above it is in that negative three to negative eight window. And I'm working with someone in uh, University of Cardiff who's done a lot of work in New Zealand and on cross cracking. And pretty much the temperatures that we're looking at in the glacial, you could be in New Zealand. With this, um, it's just matches so nicely. We've been doing some preliminary modeling on the Little Lake watershed, and it, um, it's almost impossible for there not to have been a significant amount of frost backing going on. Talk real quickly about the study design. I hope we're doing okay on time. Oh, plenty of time. Good. Okay, so this is how um, everything is put together. Okay, so this is what's called, this is a cartoon of a depth age curve. And you go and, you know, with a cord, I'll show you some pictures of that, and you collect fossils at known depths. And you get the age for those fossils, and based on that, you can build the depth age curve, and so you know what, whatever depth you're at, you, you can know how old, um, how far down you are in the core. Okay, so that's the depth age curve. So core sediments again, because I'm interested in the core, so I'm interested in big enough pieces um, for, for doing this cosmos stuff. 
develop a core chronology using radiocarbon, divide it up into slices so I can see how erosion rates track with the climate that we infer from the core record, and then get those erosion rates, couple them, publish a few papers, rest on my laurels, no. Um, go to analog landscapes, so go to similar landscapes, because this still is really just saying, I think this is happening and my numbers match. So to really make the case, you have to go to somewhere where it really is happening and say, oh yes, in these areas where it's cross-tracking, this is how fast the landscape's breaking apart and it matches what we're seeing in the record. Okay, so here's sample locations. Um, the Nobles, as I mentioned, we go hand cord out there and then we brought equipment out and cord down to the valley floor bottom. And on the old Trilingual Conference Center property, the bees were kind enough to let us do some work out there also. Um, and then, of course, you always have to have pictures of everyone who's healthy. This is hard work. This is hand corn. This is Dan Gavin and Josh Rory, my two partners in all of this. Um, these have had tons of community college students who've been out working with us. Um, they have fun until they don't. <laughs> um, yeah, it's hard work. So this is bringing out the big equipment. Um, you know, if any of you have drilled a well on your property, it's pretty much the same technique, except in this case we're trying to capture every last drop of sediment and not contaminate it. So it comes up in these tubes. You can see every, you probably can't see this, but they're numbered for the depth they're at and marked top and bottom. Um, this is at 106 feet down, and then this is what some of the stuff looks at. Like, so this is the, do you want to get the lights from me really fast, it would be easier to see this. This is the Paleo Lake bottom. So this is the top of the core going, this is top going down. And you can see here, these are called var sediments. So this is a year's worth of um, deposition coming down. Here's the organics on the top and the mineral component. This is probably the tail end of the debris flow coming down. And then I love this one. I was so excited. This is the forest floor, the original forest floor. So this is about 205 feet. The bottom of the floor was 207 feet. We went into bedrock. But this is tree. It looks like it could have come from today. This is about 50,000 years old. And it's from the original valley floor that's 200 feet below our feet now. And then right below it is the old soil. This is the old forest soil. So this has horizons in it. And this is about 50,000 years old. I just think it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> so preliminary results and then they're done. So again, this is that same age depth model like you saw before, except now it's got data on it. So these are, these squares here are everything that we've had dated so far. And time is along the bottom axis. Turns out we're still doing some of the stuff for the Holocene. So um, we're correlating a bunch of cores. So this is only showing from 20,000 years. And from how deep we've gone, you know we're below 45,000. Um, but you can see this is the non-glacial interval. So this is 45,000 to 26,000 years. And this, you can think of this as the rate of sediment coming down, right? And you can see that in the glacial, it is four times faster, the slope of this line. This is eight millimeters of a, year, a year of sediment accumulating. And that's a bare minimum because don't forget, as the lake got bigger and bigger, it, the aerial extent got bigger and bigger. So stuff was absolutely cranking during the glacial period. These mountains were just falling apart, which has implications for the way rivers respond. There's a whole bunch of feedback loop attached to that. But this was not what we expected when I started on this project two years ago. These are all of the um, Cosmo samples that we've sent out. So I'm waiting for those to be processed. And next steps, wait for the emotion <coughs> rate results. This, they're out at Purdue. It's one of two accelerators in the country um, that can Fling electrons fast enough to find essentially one of these atoms in out of 15 million stable atoms. <laughs> so, um, so we're waiting for this thing to do its thing. You know, I'll be modeling the paleo climate and using it to look at how the extent of frost packing as climate, you know, it still fluctuates even when you're in the glacial, how that would have, it's basically how it produces soil. So it's a soil production model, but it just happens to be because there's ice that's breaking the rock apart. Um, we'll
in the middle of working with people to reconstruct what the bottom of the lake looked like, what the shape of it looked like. Macrofossil analysis, so looking at trees in the cores, more core analysis, looking at the sedimentation, and then going out to places where um, processes would be behaving in the same way. And that's it. With that, I'll take any questions. Oh, and thank you so much for having me. Is there anything you can do to test to see how old that is, or, or is it so old you can't do carbon dating? Well, we, we, it's probably just past carbon age, but that's, that's on the list to be sent in. So we're sending that in. We've sent in, we've been in this iterative, we have three different cores from the big equipment, and they're not, they weren't well lined up. And so we've been in this iterative world of testing one, getting the date, and then saying, now we'll go to this one and get the date. So that one, my guess is, is older than is it probably a dead age or right around it. But we'll be testing above it too. And uh, um, can you tell what kind of wood it is? Well, uh, I can't, but the paleontologist can. Somebody can. Okay. Oh yeah, and then that will be out there. And because this line is even with just a few data points on it, it's a really good fit. It's you know like. 0.0007% chance that it's not representing what's there. Um, even if we don't know if it's, if it's dead age, um, we should be very, very, very confident about the actual age. So. I read that these mountains were created by the Missoula flood. Not these. Not these. Um, the, the Willamette Valley had parts of the Missoula flood come through it. But these mountains have been, um, they were originally um, off the coast on the continental shelf when the Cascades were being formed. You had huge amounts of sediment coming off the edge of the shelf and they were just pouring down, making, there were huge deltas and then pouring down these submarine canyons. And so that's what the all the mountains around here are, and then they've ridden up. Um, they're resting on the stilettes plate, which is a little micro plate that's being shoved underneath the coast. And so one of the reasons that everyone loves, that geologists love the Taiyi so much is it's undeformed, and it just kind of rides up um, as the stilettes plate is being shoved down. But yeah, no, the, the Missoula floods definitely came into Willamette Valley, but they didn't form these mountains. Other, Other questions for Joe? And I'll keep you updated on the results as they come. Yeah, I think, I think you'll want another presentation for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>